The exhibition consists of 12,000 cyanotypes. Um, well, actually, the project consists of 12,000 cyanotypes collected over the period of 14 months. Um, what you have on display here is just one calendar year. Uh, it's uh, materials that were exhausted or used up in while the studio was producing work. Um, so uh, what you see on the wall are cellulose-based or paper-based or wood-based um, waste materials or byproducts, really, of um, the production of my work and also the production of this show. Um, the blue tint, or why they're all blue, they're all coated in cyanotype materials, um, potassium ferrocyanide which is one of the earliest photographic printing, um, uh, photographic printing processes. It's a very simple um, chemistry. It's just coated. Um, you can coat anything that's paper-based or wood-based that will absorb it. And it's just washed in water um, to fix the image. And what these are are basically photograms of objects that were used um, in the production of work in the studio and also objects that were broken or used up or exhausted in the process. So you have waste materials or byproducts of the productive, productive life of the studio, and then you also have um, imaged on them non-paper-based um, things that were used in the productive life of the studio. So in, in that sense, it's a work that kind of tells the history of its own coming into being because there's all of this material sort of speaks to the discussions with the museum or my own travel or um, extraneous things or um, communications of my employees or invoices, bills, things like that. So it ranges from personal material of mine like uh, prescriptions, bank statements to formal business co um, uh, contact to extraneous, you know, junk mail or um, uh, invitations to exhibitions or um, films, film tickets, any, any paper-based material. So it tells a kind of very broad picture of the different productive forces that are moved through the studio. And in that sense, I thought of the studio as one big kind of machine, a machine for making a kind of picture, and that this is one work that the sum total of all of this is one depiction or one picture and in that sense it's a transparent picture it's a picture that shows exactly how it came into being everything that was involved every relationship both um, both the productive forces in terms of mechanical things and machinery and technology but also the social relationships and I think that's particularly important in art as well that a large part of um, what makes an artwork is also uh, the social relations between individuals, um, the people that come together and make something happen. So there's a kind of index or a impression or trace of all of these forces all put together. Um, so that, that was the sort of the, where the idea came from was to try to produce a totally transparent depiction, a, de a depiction that was clear and not revealed, but accepted and um, uh, didn't conceal where it came from. The show is organized chronologically. It starts from one year before the opening date of the exhibition. So uh, October 7, uh, the first, the first Materials are from October 7, uh, 2013, and it goes to October 6, 2014, so the day before the exhibition opened. Um, and the last month, and a little more, a little more than a month and about a week, I spent producing here. So I relocated to a flat um, connected to the Barbican. And, um, and proceeded to use the materials that were involved in the last stage of the show's becoming. Um, so the last month includes um, materials from London. So it goes from Los Angeles to London. 
and that's interspersed with anything um, that the studio was doing as well. So those two kinds of threads are intermixed in the last month. The arrangement of materials, aside from being chronological, was also almost like Tetris. It was just the idea of maximizing the coverage, making everything sort of fit together. So rather than choosing one thing or another, or making a decision based on whether or not I thought something was better looking or prettier than another object, it was much more about fitting everything, fitting as much as possible onto the wall and minimizing the sort of vacant space on the wall. And that became a kind of formal logic that sorted the material without um, sort of contaminating it or getting in the way of, uh, in, in, without imposing one kind of narrative or another. Because as soon as those kinds of editing decisions were, would, could be made based on what was being seen, um, then there's a kind of, uh, then there's a kind of narrative imposed. And that's something I really wanted to avoid. I wanted it to be open and I wanted there to be possibilities that I couldn't see in it, that I couldn't prescribe. So it was important to be, um, in some sense, kind of passive about how choices were made and very basic about how certain choices were made. Just as everything got imaged, it was just uh, to find a kind of dumb rule um, because I think the biggest danger would be to get in the way of that, get in the way of that openness that I thought was important for the project. where the title comes from, although I borrowed it from Hollis Frampton, it's the title of a talk that he never gave. Um, it's, a, it's a title that comes from a lecture, he gave a lecture at the Whitney in the late 70s, I think it's 1979, and he mentions this long title for a talk that he might give, or that he would alternately um, offer, but he didn't get a chance to. It's sort of, and he's playing a kind of poetic game. But in that sense, it, it's this open question. In a way, by putting that out there in public or saying that, there's a kind of empty space or a space of possibility that that unfinished um, or unfulfilled promise of a talk or a promise of a thing sort of creates. And I kind of, I related to that a lot in terms of my own, the working process is that I think of the whole, the totality of my work not so much being about particular objects, but relationships between forces, productive forces, relationships between, you know, people and things, and a more dynamic, less fixed kind of idea. And that every t and so in that sense, it's kind of an ecology. And an ecology has no outside. There's no, um, there's not something that's uh, produced, and then you don't ha you can't hide the waste. The waste is in it. The waste is part of all the choices. And that every choice produces this side effect. And I find that every time I make a work, there's a kind of side effect. And rather than trying to hide that or take that off the table, for me, it's always been, how do you adapt to that and consider that side effect in aesthetic terms? If the outcome of art objects is in an aesthetic experience, and I mean that in the Greek sense of um, relating to things becoming sensible or perceivable, not in the German romantic sense of beauty or something. But if it relates to how we perceive things in the world and how we relate to things, that the byproduct of an aesthetic act would also have an aesthetic implication. It speaks to the origins of that act. And so I find that that always creates a kind of way that each work spills into another work, each project spills into another project, because there's a kind of unfinished or open question that each produces in very literal terms, you know, uh, in very concrete sense, like um, a material that's left behind or um, some other side effect. Maybe I should mention the, the book project, just, to, just for clarity, is um, part of this work, or part of the show, and it's a one to two archive of every object that was produced. So on the wall, you have about 7,000 cyanotypes. Um, 7,000 objects could fit from an overall, I think we produced about, um, over the course of the year, it was about 12,000 objects. 
So not everything could fit on to the wall, which is why a certain kind of strategy for tiling needed to be used. But the books contain everything. And there's um, 41 volumes, and, um, and they're also included in the show. So there's a different kind of experience of, and a different kind of archive that's sort of produced there. And I guess one last note is that I thought the curved space was a particular, a very interesting problem to me and immediately made me think of the panoramas, 19th century panoramas, which is also the time period that the cyanotype technology comes from. And also um, the sort of golden age of the sort of gentleman's encyclopedia and um, the public museum and, and so many elements of, um, of uh, modernity sort of blossom at that point. And there was a kind of logic to you know, the notion of archiving and organizing the world. And um, the book is a repository for documentation and the spectacle of panorama and the museum all related in some way that, um, I don't know, linked together these ideas for me, linked together these sort of approaches to um, the initial thought to try to make a, a kind of transparent picture. <laughs>